Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the battery design and safety session. Uh, today's session uh, we will be divided into two halves. The first half, which is battery design approach and guidelines, will be presented by Shadul Jade, and the second session on uh, second half of the session on battery safety will be um, will be uh, presented by Mukul Jangit. The first portion of the presentation uh, will talk about the fundamentals of battery design for Formula Student events. It will assist. Uh, in making design calculations, cell selection, and design decisions for the battery. It will also provide general safety practices and guidelines and create awareness about the consequences of bad design. The second part of the session, uh, we put up our safety goggles to focus on the safety aspects of Formula Student EV project. We take a quick journey through the life cycle from cell selection, design, assembly, uh, racing to incident control, and get our checklist and ready so that we are safe throughout the season. So without further ado, I'd like to um, bring about Shardul uh, to begin today's session. Hi, Shardul. Could, could you unmute yourself? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, hi, I'm Shardul Jade. Uh, I hope I find you happy and healthy at home. Uh, also, forgive us for the, uh, the preparation that we have over here being uh, a little bit of informal. I try to keep it uh, as uh, uh, organized as possible. So I'm Shardul Jade. I work at Ether Energy as a hardware engineer. I was also a uh, a part of the formula student design team in my college years where I designed the battery pack and the BMS for three seasons uh, at IIT Bombay Racing. So today's session, uh, we'll begin with the battery design and safety guidelines. Uh, these, this will be uh, an, a top perspective on the fundamentals of battery design. This will not include a lot of um, um, this will include a lot of design calculations that you'll need for starting up your design, as well as some information for teams who are uh, both beginners as well as intermediate. Uh, this will also help you in cell selection design and uh, cell selection and other uh, uh, calculations that you need for your battery design. So let us begin. Uh, so at the end of the presentation, uh, you will definitely be know, uh, be aware of how to design your battery pack, do the design calculations, right from cell selections to the configurations in series parallel, and uh, how to keep your cells healthy uh, so that you are safe as well as your vehicle performs better. Mm, this will also give you uh, feedback on the risk and of wrong design. So what are the not, what you should not do while handling your cells? Uh, let us begin. So we'll begin with the intent for your design. So essentially you guys are here because you are participating in Formula Bharat events. Uh, you may be trying it, the electric uh, event for the first time, or this may be your second or third year, but you should always begin with uh, a target in mind. Your target may be anything. It may be a goal in terms of points. It may be the duration that you need to finish your endurance in. It may be the acceleration time that you want to achieve or the weight targets. Now you have to be very precise, uh, very uh, adamant that you stick to that target throughout the season because that is what will dictate how you design your battery. Uh, the flow for your battery design will generally begin with taking these targets in mind and uh, arriving at parameters, uh, target parameters. For example, how much energy that you need to can, uh, carry in your uh, uh, with your vehicle, how much weight uh, you need to achieve with your battery pack, or what should be the maximum current you can draw from your battery pack so as you achieve a, a certain acceleration time target. Then you proceed with the next step of selecting your motor and controller, which will give you an idea of what is the battery voltage that you need to design your battery for. Then once you have the battery voltage and the target uh, currents that you need to, um, that your battery should be uh, able to provide, and uh, how much is the energy capacity that you need to carry with it, we will come with cell selection and battery configuration. Uh, I will be explaining energy capacity and uh, uh, discharge currents uh, and other terminologies in a bit of time. So let us begin with cell selections. 
So cells are essentially your building blocks of your battery pack. It may be a uh, different types of uh, electrochemical cell. It may be mm, uh, energy storage unit like supercapacitors or uh, other units, but uh, like fuel cell or lead acid batteries. But those are restricted for the competition like fuel cells. So uh, you should definitely uh, uh, avoid uh, using those. But uh, we'll, uh, for the sake of keeping this presentation precise, we will only be looking towards lithium ion uh, chemistry of cells. So why lithium ion? Mostly because they have higher capacity. They have a wider range in the uh, energy capacity that is available with you. They have higher uh, discharge current rates. You, they also have very low weight as opposed to uh, equivalent lead acid battery or other types of battery. That makes your battery carry much more energy in a lower weight and lower volume. But you should be extremely careful with uh, using these cells because lithium ion cells are extremely dangerous. So about your cell, whenever you're looking at cells, you will have a specific set of parameters that you want from your battery pack. Uh, in order to get to there, you will have the parameters reflected on your cells. So when you're selecting cells, you will uh, first be selecting the type of chemistry that you have with the cells. So in any data sheet of a cell, you will have the cell chemistry mentioned at the top. This cell chemistry helps you in uh, figuring out what kind of uh, discharge currents the cell technology provides, what kind of shape or structure the cells will have, what is the ampere hour capacity that you're carrying with the cells and other such features. This will be, uh, this will also give you a reference uh, whether to how safe uh, are the cells in using and uh, handling uh, in case of mishaps. Uh, the cell parameters which include are mostly the nominal voltage, which is your, uh, which is your typical voltage at, uh, uh, around 50% SOC. SOC is your state of charge. I'll come back to that later. So the param uh, uh, one of the uh, parameters, key parameters is your nominal voltage. Then you have the charge uh, maximum voltage cutoff. So your cell can only handle, lithium ion cells can only handle up to a certain uh, over voltage uh, value, which in this case it is mentioned 4.2 volts. Then you will have the charge and discharge characteristics of your cell. Charge characteristics is essentially how much current you can pass through the battery to charge it. That will dictate how long it takes for your battery to charge. And uh, the discharge characteristics uh, also uh, show how much current you can draw from your battery pack. So there are two discharge characteristics uh, current in your battery pack. Uh, the first being the continuous current uh, and the other being a peak uh, or maximum current you can draw from it. So you should uh, only be considering the continuous current while uh, operating it uh, in a nor uh, in a normal uh, while using the battery. Your peak current you can only draw for a very momentary amount of uh, momentary amount of time. Like in this data sheet, it is mentioned for about one second you can draw up to hundred amperes, but continuous current rating is twenty amperes. The other parameter is your energy capacity. So rated discharge capacity, which is mentioned here, it is the energy capacity, the energy that you're carrying in your, in your single cell. So this can is generally mentioned in terms of ampere hours or milliampere hours. As you can see, it is 2500 MAH, which implies milliampere hours, so which is 2.5 ampere hours. So what this energy means is you can draw about 2.5 amperes from this cell for one hour. Now explaining another uh, other terminology that you use in, uh, design, select, uh, in designing cells is the C rate. So your C rate essentially says what, uh, what factor of current you are drawing from your, uh, from your cell in terms of your ampere hour capacity. So if a 3.5 AH cell, uh, if you are drawing one, uh, if you are drawing 3.5 amperes from it, you will be discharging the cell in one hour or in other words, you can draw the uh, 3.5 amps for one hour. And this is uh, said to be one C, uh, one C discharge. Similarly, if you are drawing half of that current, which is 1.75 amps, it will take two hours to discharge the battery pack. This will be mentioned as 0.2 C. This is a terminology. You can extrapolate to other factors. So your data sheet will also mention what is the maximum C rate you can charge or discharge your battery pack from uh, your cell with. So carrying the amount of energy that you need, uh, 
uh, your energy is uh, uh, your energy is essentially either mentioned in watt hours or joules. Both units being same, there is only a conversion rate, fa a conversion factor of uh, hours to seconds. But essentially, this says how many watts you can draw for one particular hour. Similar as ampere hour capacity, but uh, this gives you a total energy that you are carrying in the particular cell. This helps you while calculating the total energy in your battery pack and uh, how much, uh, uh, how, what duration you will be you running the battery pack uh, while you are doing your endurance run, for example. Similarly, power can also be uh, written in terms of C rating. That uh, if your battery pack is somewhere around fifty ampere hours. At 1C, you will be able to draw 50 amperes for one hour and uh, or in other terms, 12.95 watts for uh, one hour or at 0.5C, you can draw 6.475 watts for two hours. So as I mentioned earlier, your SOC and your nominal voltage. So your nominal voltage uh, that uh, is uh, mentioned as specified in the data sheet, it is somewhere around 3.6 or 3.2 volts based on the chemistry of cell uh, you are using. So this nominal voltage is the, uh, so the voltage versus uh, state of charge, which is the energy content in your battery pack. That is not a linear curve as you would expect, but it's kind of shaped like uh, this particular curve as you can see on the screen. So at the very high SOC near the 100% SOC range, closer to the 100% SOC range, you will see the voltage has a higher slope. Implies your voltage will drop down drastically as you draw current as well as voltage will rise drastically as you push current into it. Similarly, in the uh, near the 0% to 10% SOC range, there also your voltage will change way, um, uh, drastically over the percentage change in SOC. So nominal voltage is the voltage at which the plateau of this curve appears. Okay. Uh, now there are various types of classifications of cells that you select. So uh, two types uh, I'll be mentioning over here. One is by chemistry, uh, chemistry of the cells that you're using. So based on what is the electrolyte, what are the electrodes uh, made of, uh, your uh, chemistry will, uh, will uh, dictate. And your chemistry will dictate what is the uh, discharge characteristics and uh, safety characteristics of your cells. The other classification is with respect to your shapes. So uh, you can see one table. This is just for reference. Uh, so for example, you have a cell chemistry of lithium cobalt oxide, which have high energy capacity, but low profile, uh, uh, but packaging, uh, packaging is very less, but uh, these also have other restrictions that these are not available in higher capacity uh, volume, uh, higher capacity uh, cells. There are commonly used cells like lithium ferrous phosphate or LFP cells, LFP4 cells which have a nominal voltage of 3.2 volts and which are most, uh, which are more safe than lithium cobalt oxide and uh, NMC. But still being lithium based uh, uh, cells, you should still be careful with these cells. The other major type is the NMC, which is nickel manganese cobalt. This also have a typical uh, nominal voltage of 3.6 volts. And these are also widely used in uh, electric vehicles and other applications. Now, coming to the shapes, uh, shape classification of your cells, there are three major uh, types of, uh, uh, three major shapes that you get your cells in. Well, first is the cylindrical, prismatic, and pouch. So cylindrical cells, as the name suggests, will have a cylindrical shape, and they do come in standard sizes. So what happens is your cells will have a fixed dimensions and fixed si uh, size based on the capacity of cell you are using. And uh, these have a rigid enclosure. Uh, the casing is made of metal because of which you get some rigidity uh, in assembling and handling these cells. But uh, due to small size and small capacity, you have to con connect multiple of these cells in series and parallel combination to arrive at the configuration that you want. Uh, another thing being uh, these cells do uh, emit some gases whenever these uh, go into a failure uh, case. So you should also provide uh, required venting or venting for the gases or fumes uh, whenever you're designing a battery made of cylindrical cells. The other type is prismatic cells. So prismatic cells, the layup for the cells is similar to cylindrical cells, uh, but the shape is more, uh, more or less a cuboid. 
which also have a rigid enclosure it becomes easier for the cells to be handled uh, the terminals also the uh, output electrodes or the tabs they also come out with a bolting or a stud mechanism which becomes easier for assembling these cells whenever you want with and making the interconnection simpler but because these have rigid enclosure and with the uh, bolting terminal and other uh, the rigidity that it provides the energy density or the specific energy of this these particular cells are lower the third type uh, most commonly used type is the pouch cell so as the name suggests these are pouch cells with uh, uh, because of which uh, the enclosure for these are not as rigid as you find in cylindrical or prismatic cells because of which uh, these cells can expand when they are charging or uh, expand when they are charging or discharging or whenever there is a gaseous uh, um, emission happening inside because these don't have a rigid enclosure you need to provide rigid mechanical support to these cells but since these don't have a mechanical enclosure these are the most energy dense cells among the three that you find over here next up is connecting cells so once you have selected the cells based on the temp chemistry and the uh, the shape that you want to build your cells in the next uh, fact uh, thing you need to consider while designing is arranging the cells arranging the cells in series and parallel combination to arrive at your de desired configuration on the battery voltage so your battery voltage for example may be higher uh, for example you may need a your motor controller may need an input voltage of somewhere around 50 volts 50 volt is the nominal operating voltage of your controller it will also have a, a range of operation but uh, uh, let us consider for this example that you have a motor controller which needs a 50 volt battery supply so in order to reach at 50 volts you will connect a uh, a cell which has a nominal voltage of 3.6 volts 14 of them in series so as to arrive at 14 times 3.6 which is 50.4 volts as your nominal operating voltage be aware that this is nominal and not maximum or minimum operating for maximum and minimum you will have to refer to the data sheet for example if 3.6 volt cell has a maximum of 4.2 volts then 4.2 times 14 will give you the maximum somewhere around 58 volts is your maximum operating voltage range for this particular battery pack you should have a controller which can with withstand 50 volts uh, 58 volts uh, as your maximum voltage this is to provide a series configuration when you are adding cells in series the ampere r capacity of the uh, module does not change because you are drawing pushing the same current through each and every cell because of which the ampere r capacity of the uh, this particular module remains the same which is uh, for a, uh, if you have 3.58 ah cell this will become 14 series cells with 50.4 volts and 3.5 ah so in order to connect uh, in uh, so you your battery won't be able to supply current to your motor controller for very long because the energy capacity is very less so in order to increase the energy capacity what you do is you connect cells in parallel to each other so for example your battery needs uh, 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 the energy capacity for uh, completing an endurance run where it needs somewhere around uh, uh, 38 ampere hours of capacity so in order to reach a 38 ampere hour capacity you will connect 11 cells of 3.5 ah in parallel to each other so that 3.5 times 11 will give you 38.5 ah as the ampere hour capacity of the complete battery pack so now you will be connecting all these cells in parallel to each and every series module so you will have 11 cells connected in parallel to each other this particular module connected in series with another such module and 14 such series modules are to be connected in order to reach at a configuration of 50 volts and 38 ampere hours okay so this is a trivia like uh, what uh, trivia question uh, what is the difference between 14s 11p and 11p 14s p stands for parallel for uh, s stands for series so 14s 11p and 11p 14s each of them will have a battery voltage of 50 volts and a capacity of 38.5 ah but uh, what will be the difference just try to think of a reason uh, this is uh, pretty simple but uh, just let me know if you can uh, if you have any doubt with this 
So next we come at once we have selected the series and parallel configuration, you will have to fix the cells together at a particular point uh, in inside your battery enclosure. So in order to fix your cells, uh, the shape of the cells uh, is what decides what kind kind of uh, fixture or holders that you need to uh, use in your battery pack. For example, for cylindrical cells, since they come in standard size and standard shape, you don't need to worry a lot in designing the holders because across the industry these cells will be widely used because of which the kind of cell holders available for these cells will also be widely available for example you can have a hex packaging like in the first image or a square packaging like in the second image but you need to be careful about the differences in these because your hex packaging will increase your packaging efficiency but will reduce uh, reduce the space between the cells for thermal uh, air to flow through it and uh, your square packaging will in improve the airflow but will reduce your packaging efficiency similarly for your prismatic cells your prismatic cells will also have a rigid enclosure so it becomes much simpler for multiple cells to be connected together without providing a, a, a very heavy support a bulky support for it also the interconnection becomes simpler in prismatic the third type for pouch cells you need to provide a very stiff a very rigid enclosure but without any sharp edges because the pouches are very prone to uh, getting punctured because uh, with any sharp corners or edges and on your uh, cell holders you should also provide decent uh, gap in between the pouch cell so that the cells can expand as well as the air can flow through so that you cool the cells along as you go next up we have the cell holder uh, cell interconnections so once you have the cell holders uh, cell holder designs selected you know where the cell tabs will lie now wherever the cell tabs will lie you need to connect the series and parallel combination as and when required so in order to connect for cylindrical cell the most commonly used practice is welding uh, of the cells you can use nickel strips or some metallic strips to weld as shown in the second image or you can have uh fusible wire feeders to uh fusible wire linkages like you can see in the first uh, image but uh, you have to be very careful about what current will be passing through these feeders and these uh, uh these uh, bus bars uh, as you can call it uh, because that bus bars will also heat if you don't provide it enough uh, thickness for uh, pouch cells uh, there are multiple ways of uh, connecting the cells together like uh, layering uh, in parallel or clamping them together for prismatic cells the easiest way is bolting them together as you can see in this particular image so you can see the first image uh, on the left is where you have pouch cells the tabs which are like fins coming out of the cells you can just bend them and uh, uh, connect them in parallel together and clamp it down with a downward force the first image on the right is also clamping it together across a bus bar and the third image is of prismatic cells being connected with a bus bar because they have directly bolt mounting available now cell thermals when you are designing a battery pack cell thermals is not something that you take very lightly because cells operate in a very uh, uh, specified uh, very uh, clear cut defined temperature range any time you let the cell go beyond this temperature range either the cell will degrade <coughs> its life will de uh, decrease or these can also become uh, hazardous and uh, this can also lead to major safety problems so the major reasons for cell heating are internal resistance and internal electrochemical thermochemical reactions but you should design your uh, battery pack so as to keep your thermals in mind you should not you should not uh, randomly put fans in multiple locations without keeping into consideration uh, how do uh, how the airflow will be work uh, how the airflow will be passing through it you should provide proper ducting uh, for uh, air inlet as well as air air exit and you should also have a uh, thermal uh, temperature sensors which is your thermistors at various various locations so that you know where, where the hotspots of your battery pack are located and you can place your fans accordingly you can do either thermal simulations with it or uh, do an extensive testing with it next is uh, providing proper ventilation for the cells now being lithium ion cells there can be various uh, gaseous discharges happening if at all uh, worst comes the cells go into some kind of uh, uh, faulty operation 
that cells will expand or puncture so there will be gaseous discharge so you should provide definite venting to these cells and you should not make an airtight uh, compressed battery pack because in that case this essentially becomes a huge huge and very dangerous bomb so yeah you should uh, have very precise uh, venting uh, air inlet outlet thermals should be uh, extremely uh, carefully designed uh, for your battery pack and not something that you do at the very last moment next is uh, why uh, is keeping the cells in its uh, specified temperature and uh, voltage ranges so important because when you draw huge amounts of current through the battery pack uh, through the cell each cell goes through a thermochemical uh, reaction because of which this cell degrades inherently because of using it this is called cell uh, cell aging and uh, the end of life of your cell is when your cell reaches 80% of your initial capacity so for example if you have a 38 or a 50 ampere hour uh, cell a 50 ampere hour battery pack at whenever uh, after each cycle your cell capacity will slowly decrease uh, after a particular number of cycles your cell capacity will decrease to somewhere around 80% of uh, initial capacity and that is the end of life of the cell so that is why you need to be very careful with these cells in order to ensure the longevity of the cells because most uh, in most cases you will be using these cells over and over in multiple seasons yeah so next up we will go uh, with the battery management system i will just skim skim through the bms i will not be explaining the electronics or uh, what goes inside a bms because you should be aware of uh, those things and uh, this is more toward the battery design but your bms is a critical uh, critical uh, component of your battery because it keeps your cells healthy safe as well as uh, keeps you uh, keeps you uh, uh, in general safe so your cells uh, need to be the temperature the voltage and the current of the cell that you are drawing that is uh, is it's uh, these are the key parameters that your uh, cell monitor uh, bms monitors at all point of time so your cells should not go into over voltage or under voltage your currents that you are drawing from the battery pack should not uh, be uh, should not exceed the charge and discharge uh, limitation that is mentioned and your temperature of your battery pack should not your cells each and every cell should not exceed whatever is mentioned in that particular data sheet the other features include cell balancing and uh, communications i will uh, explain balancing in more detail so uh, for the beginners balancing is essentially the, when you are uh, using your cells each cell even if they are from the same manufacturer same uh, same batch same capacity even produced from the same uh, plant and uh, uh, batch what happens is uh, there are inherently manufacturing differences between each and every cell because of which whenever you are drawing current out of the cell not all the cells will uh, will uh, Uh, drain out current at this and uh, drain out energy at the same rate because of which for example if the first cell is slightly uh, it has a higher internal resistance or it has uh, some other manufacturing differences which causes this cell to drain faster because of which what happens is when you are draining the cell the first cell uh, the extreme right cell that drops to the 0% soc uh before other cells have even decided uh, discharged to its complete uh, through it to its complete uh, limit because of which there is this stray energy which is left in the battery but you cannot use this particular energy so what happens is when you are charging this particular battery again your uh, discharge cell will be at a lower energy and you will not be pumping the complete energy to all these cells because the current flows through each and every cell uh, through all of these cells in one line so what happens is the first two cells will charge to the maximum voltage first and third cell will not have charged to its maximum limit because of which you again have less energy that you can draw from your battery pack so this is the uh, this essentially is the energy that is lost that you cannot use in uh, use at all from the battery pack so what do you do about it so there are two ways of doing this so either you uh, Uh, the simpler and uh, more convenient and economic way of doing this is you discharge the cells which have a higher capacity so in this case the first and second cell <coughs> you discharge them self discharge them by connecting a resistor uh, with it 
so that this cell uh, discharges whatever is the extra energy left in this particular cells and it comes to the same energy level as the third particular cell so this what happens is essentially you're losing the energy in one particular cycle but over multiple cycles the energy that is available to you that remains intact the other way of doing is active balancing which is uh, transferring this particular energy into the energy uh, into the cell which has lower energy but that involves a lot amount of hardware as well as it becomes way costlier than what you are saving in uh, saving the energy with okay so next up is battery safety now uh, let me be really really serious about this point of time lithium ion cells are extremely dangerous you should never take them lightly you should never mishandle them and you should handle them uh, extremely carefully so i share with you some images what happens if you mishandle your uh, uh, cells so this is your pouch cell which is overcharged so this bulges out where there are huge gases accumulated inside and even a single pierce or a single puncture can result in a uh, huge uh, huge amount of chemical fires the another uh, uh, safety risk that you have is thermal runaway where a cell goes into uncontrolled and controllable heating and it heats up so much that it catches fire and because of that heat other cells around also heat up and go into thermal runaway it acts like a chain reaction and there is no way of stopping it without uh, uh, removing the heat uh, the only way of stopping this uh, from spreading is removing the heat away this is one of the incident that happened in a uh, formula student germany where a group a bunch of students carried their battery pack into their hotel where it uh, because of some accident there was a huge fire the team was definitely disqualified and uh, stop from participating in any further events you might have already heard of phones exploding your uh, segways and uh, hoverboards exploding so you should be really careful with using lithium ion cells because you don't want yourself or your car to go into flames yeah so to conclude you should always have your battery parameters figured out and you should always have sufficient margin over what limits your battery pack uh, can handle and uh, to what limits you can you should use your battery pack you should give decent margin uh, so that you do not even uh, with tolerances coming into picture you will not reach uh, breach those particular limits your bms and your insulation monitoring device your imd those should be extensively tested before even installing it into the battery pack because an untested bms is, is essentially a blind hit uh, trying to get a battery right you should always use a compatible charger never never compromise on what charger you are using you should not use a charger which is from an unreliable source or a vendor and uh, always take precautions while charging your battery pack and uh, most importantly think safe and think clean you should always have safety as your priority in designing your battery pack not just designing handling as well as uh, servicing assembling as well as handling your battery pack and the cleaner you make your design the easier it is for you to handle the risk if at all they arise uh, that is the end of my presentation uh, i hope you like it i hope it was informative uh, we will be going to q and a uh, mm, okay cool so i will be reading a few questions that you have posted into the chat uh, so the first question yeah what voltage should we take of a cell to calculate the energy of the cell or accumulator pack according to the rule book it should be maximum cell voltage but some of the definitions tells you to use nominal voltage so for calculating the energy content in your battery pack you should always uh, you should use the nominal voltage so uh, let me rephrase uh, for calculating the energy capacity in your battery pack you should use the nominal voltage but to comply with the rule books you should always mention what is the maximum battery voltage you will be operating at because the voltage dictates the voltage rating of your battery pack and all the components in your battery pack mm, i hope it was clear uh, you can uh, uh, ask a follow up question or follow it up later uh, on the on email if uh, i do not make myself clear enough 
next uh for ev 2.2.1 will the power of battery pack be calculated as nominal voltage times current or maximum voltage times current i think so uh, it's the same question uh but yeah again so for calculating the energy it will be nominal voltage but for calculating the um for calculating the maximum power that you are drawing from your battery pack that should be your instantaneous voltage times your inter- instantaneous current so your maximum power that you can draw from your battery pack will not exceed the instantaneous voltage times instantaneous current you are drawing this may be peak current this may be maximum current continuous current and uh, this may be maximum voltage or this may be the uh, voltage at that particular point of time what do you mean by layering so layering as i mentioned in cell uh, interconnections is basically you bend the tabs of the pouch cell and you bend the tabs of the next pouch cell on top of the other you put some kind of clamping or a stiff material below this particular tab and you compress it and uh, layer it um, layer multiple cells together so essentially for your pouch cells you have uh, the tabs which you bend over one another and you clamp it from uh, from top and bottom so this uh, in sense is layering the cell tabs together uh, what do we calculate energy generated uh, sorry how do we calculate it uh, calculate energy generated and thereby energy is stored uh, in the battery pack through region breaking so region breaking is essentially whatever is the voltage so basically whenever your motor is trying to pump current back into the battery pack it will act as a generator and because it is generating uh, and it is connected with the battery pack uh, as the load or as the sink for your uh, generated energy the bat- uh, the generator voltage the terminal voltage of your motor controller will go above their battery voltage so that voltage going above so whatever is the voltage at the generator output terminals times the current that your that your generator is pushing into the battery that is the total uh, power that you are pushing into the battery uh, so that will give you uh, over a duration or ever uh, uh, integrating it over time you will get what is the uh, energy that you are pumping back into the battery pack so with region you have to be extremely careful again because region uh, essentially increases the voltage beyond your battery uh, voltages so all the components that you are using in your battery pack has to be rated for the maximum region voltage as well as the region current that you are pushing into the battery pack your battery charging current essentially your regenerated current is the charging current for the battery pack so your bat, uh, regenerative charging current uh, uh, sorry your regenerative current is the max, uh, should be under the maximum charging current for your battery pack next up how to determine the cross section of the fusible links and what will be the process to connect a fusible link to the main bus bar so that particular thing is uh, an example which you can see in uh, tesla um, tesla motors vehicles batteries so they have ja- used a very uh, uh, they have done a, a very extensive research and uh, published papers on it as well how uh, the cross section of those particular fuses fusible links are uh, 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 measured so essentially the material you are using for the fuse will have a certain uh, uh, fusing temperature or a temperature at it, at which it melts and uh, breaks away so your current passing through that fuse is your nominal current it's not the extreme short circuit current so whenever your uh, so your fuse essentially only acts when there is an uncontrolled extreme current going through your battery pack which ideally should not happen in normal use case it only happens in a fault case so your fusible link should be designed in such a way that in nominal cases it should not have such a huge resistance that it will generate heat and heat itself up and then break uh, break away it should uh, be able to conduct the nominal current from your battery pack um, for an elongated period of time but whenever the current exceeds uh, beyond a particular uh, limit whereby the i square r the energy that is produced at the fusible link that goes uh, that heats up the fusible link to a temperature to its melting temperature that is how you design a fuse so this applies to the fusible links or this applies to the fuses that you select in your battery pack as well 
uh, for more details on this particular uh, question, you can uh, look up uh, various uh, videos available in uh, on the Tesla battery pack breakup. But uh, fusible links, if you are not, if you have not done it or if you haven't studied it, I recommend uh, avoiding using it right away. Mm. What process? Okay, the second part is pending. What will be the process to connect the fusible link to the main bus bar? In most cases, it will be spot welding or ultrasound welding that you use for connecting this because that doesn't heat up the fuse while you are doing the welding. It's only a, a what do you call? It? It's only a localized heating. Hmm. Okay. Next question: What kind of fasteners can be used for bus bars in case of pouch cell terminal connections? You need to use uh, fasteners. You can use your normal um, M3, M4 uh, fasteners, but you should have a positive locking on the uh, nuts that you are using. So uh, you cannot use uh, nylon lock nuts or any kind of plastic lock nuts or even uh, um, uh, even thread lockers because that uh, thread lockers or the nylon heats up when the bus bar heats up and uh, the locking mechanism for those lock nuts will uh, will essentially render it the positive uh, locking useless. Yeah, please comply with the uh, rule book uh, question that is mentioned whenever you are using with cells. You should uh, not use. Uh, you should have positive locking and you should not use nylon lock nuts or any kind of lock nuts, which uh, changes its locking properties with temperature. Uh, design a weak point in the casing. Do not build a bomb. How could you give an, ex uh, could you give an example as to what kind of weak points are uh, reasonable to expect in a casing? Uh, so weak points. So you have your battery pack. You have the corners of your bat uh, your battery enclosure will have will uh, will either have uh, aluminum sheets or steel sheets or carbon fiber sheets even. So whenever you are having all uh, the whenever you are uh, making interconnections with these sheet, you are welding it or you are providing with uh, with a bolting or clamping. You should be sure that that welding or that clamping can handle the amount of stresses or loads uh, uh, as mentioned in the rule book. For example, you have horizontal and vertical accelerations that your battery pack can need to handle without uh, it getting uh, getting damaged. So your SES uh, uh, for your battery pack will include the test that you need to perform. Uh, Okay, uh, essentially to not build a bomb, all you need to provide is proper ventilation uh, of decent enough size. You need not have an airtight. That is the only requirement. But uh, if you are reaching a stage where you are essentially your battery pack is not having enough ventilation or uh, that you have to question that particular point, it's it in itself is uh, kind of like a, a deal breaker for you. Okay, next question. How do we determine the appropriate thickness of bus bars, let's say for copper, to prevent from overheating? Uh, okay, so bus bar calculation, that also is an extensive topic that you need to research on yourself. So bus bar, uh, it may be aluminum or copper or whatever material that you need to use. So the cross section of the bus bar is through which the current will be flowing. The nominal current from your battery pack will be flowing. Uh, one very easy uh, thumb rule is whatever cross section wires you are using gauge wires that you are using for uh, your uh, external hardware uh, for your power cables that much cross section is okay to be used uh, for designing a bus bar but there this therein lies a problem that these wires are stranded wires and these have extra insulation on top of it which prevents the heat from going out and prevents the heat, uh, prevents the um, um, the uh, the cooling of the uh, wires as well. For your bus bars, that will not be the case. So for calculations, all you need to consider is first of all, what is the current path between one cell to the other? Is it the vertical phase? Is it the horizontal flat phase that you are allowing the current to pass through? Or is it the cross section? If you have an elongated piece of bus bar, what is the cross section of the, that particular bus bar? That will decide on what should be the uh, thickness or cross section that you need to use uh, for copper. Um, 
mostly uh, if you go to the fundamentals all you have to do is figure out what will be the cross section what will be the um, resistance for that particular bus bar and keep it as low as possible something of the order of uh, less than a few milli, uh, less than milli uh, milli ohms a, so any cross section which goes beyond one particular uh, beyond uh, milli ohms uh, milli ohms um scale that is um, not recommended uh for more detailed calculations i don't think so i'll be able to cover it right away uh, you can ping me on this particular question uh, at a later point i will uh, reply to that with calculations as well uh next question can there be drawbacks to bending or hole punching on cell tabs yes there will be drawbacks bending there will be drop uh, one particular drawback that you won't be able to bend and unbend the cells beyond a particular time uh, beyond a particular number of times because your cell tabs essentially are very thin fins with a very thin cross section because of which if you are bending it and uh, unbending it back it will become brittle over time and the uh, so once you have bent the cell tab in particular shape you should ideally not unbend it or uh, remove it um, many uh, remote at all second is uh, punching holes through the cell tabs that essentially reduces the cross section of uh, uh, cross section that you have for the current to flow but if you are punching the holes on the face and your your bus bar is uh, clamped to um, uh, face to face with each other your cell tabs are clamped face to face with each other that doesn't become a huge problem but any kind of contact will come with contact resistance so the more contact area the lower is the contact resistance so the lower will be the heating of that particular bus bar mm, okay next question are the tap of tabs of pouch cells acting as fusible element sufficient for parallel cell fusing Requ okay uh, let me go through that again are the tabs of pouch cells acting as fusible elements sufficient for parallel cell fusing requirements or is an additional fusible link required no cell tabs are not to be considered as fusible links cell tabs are where the current flows through and they are not supposed to be heated they are not supposed to take take current more than what the battery can provide so you should not use uh, cell tabs as your fusible elements you should definitely have an additional fusible link wherever needed or wherever possible uh shouldn't we take into account the contact resistance between cell tabs and bus bar while considering the thermal design of the pack how to overcome the contact resistance issue and uh, how to take this into account yes you definitely need to con consider the contact resistance the larger the cross section the lower will be the contact resistance of your uh, uh, of your battery pack uh and the more the clamping force you apply across the bus bar also your re contact resistance will uh, go down so essentially you are trying to deform the surfaces and uh, merge them together by applying enough clamping force so that your contact resistance reduces uh okay so uh for reducing contact resistance you definitely before you make uh, uh, connections you need to wipe the surface off with some corrosion resistive uh, sorry corrosion removal or you should remove the oxide layer from your cell tabs while making the connections but be aware that whenever you are removing them back again the surface will get oxidized so oxidation is also one uh, factor which affects the contact resistance uh yeah so tin coating or nickel coating is generally a nice way of uh, reducing the oxidation so your cells by default uh, the pouch cells by default come with tin coating uh, available with them Mm. and uh, nickel coating also helps but uh, that will definitely reduce your uh, that will definitely uh, increase your uh, conductor resistance as well so you should have very thin uh, coating for these particular uh, materials okay uh, next question any advice on full proofing to prevent uh, wrong connections with radlock maintenance plugs so uh, for maintenance plugs uh, for a to in order to provide uh, prevent a wrong connection first of all your design should not pro should not provide uh, should not have a provision in which a wrong connection has be uh, will be made so your ra radlock uh, connectors that you generally use for maintenance plugs those will have a particular size cable that you are using 
so that cable should not be long, such a uh, should not be so long that your cells can ever be connected in a wrong manner so that is called pokayoke in industrial terms so pokayoke is full proofing against any wrong connection or wrong assembly so your design itself should have the lens exactly fitting that particular bus bar uh, sorry that particular terminals that you need to connect with the maintenance plugs even if you uh, switch between the maintenance plugs alternating between the maintenance plugs is acceptable but your battery design your cell output terminals should not be such that you can make a wrong connection with the rad lock and uh, terminals so ha huh, so this comes with design of your uh, main uh, battery pack and uh, in uh, the order in which you are arranging the cells so that is how you prevent uh, and that is how you do a full proofing of uh, the wrong connections so as a first next question as a first year team how do we how do you suggest we decide the battery capacity of our car as a starting point in the design phase so for this this becomes more of a fundamental question so when you are a first a first year team there are various ways you can approach this first way is uh, you can calculate how much energy so based on the power that you have uh, in your motor controllers uh, based on the motor controller that you have selected and based on for example the time that you have to complete your endurance run say for example you are targeting the endurance run to be completed for in 30 minutes so you have 30 minutes of time you have uh, an average power based on your uh, simulations you will have some average power that you are drawing from your motor controller uh, in your uh, from your battery pack so that average power times the duration that you have that will give you the energy content that you need to carry along with it so this is a very crude calculation for more detailed calculation you need to do a lot of simulation you have to have the track layout you need to know how much straight patches are there you need to know how much you will be breaking you need to know what curvature what turns you have in the uh, in the uh, on the track this is one way of doing it the other way is uh, every year formula student uh, other international events or even bharat might uh, publish the uh, benchmark results uh, for the efficiency score you have uh, as part of your uh, uh, 1000 points so you have an efficiency score which is based on how much energy you are using so every team which completes an endurance run or even otherwise their energy consumption based on the energy meter data that is published online and that is available for you to access so you can have a benchmark that based on this much but uh, this much weight of the your car or based on this much weight this much energy is consumed to complete this particular endurance run so that is also one way of another way of doing it mm, okay so if you need to discuss more on it you can contact directly uh, us at any other point of time yeah mm. cool so next question can we use contactors as maintenance plugs you should not because contactors can weld maintenance plugs are something which you can remove contactors are not something which you can remove so maintenance plugs are some kind of removable object uh, removable contact between two terminals that you need to remove whenever you are working on their battery pack contactor if they have fused or welded together you have no way of knowing it unless you have auxiliary contacts on the contactor so contactors are not recommended for maintenance plugs next up how do we model the discharge rate of the battery at the endurance event to ensure that we do not run out of charge so uh, one correction over here the discharge rate dictates how much is the current that you are drawing the energy capacity is how much is the energy that you will need to complete your endurance run so for uh, uh, again to answer the question about the endurance event you need to know how much uh, time that you are targeting for that particular um, endurance run so for example if you are a first year team you may not have a very um, um very ambitious target of completing the amb- endurance run at the for, uh, within say 20 minutes you may keep a buffer that 25 to 30 minutes or even 40 minutes is your target so for that much duration how much is the power that you are drawing at each point of time and uh, that integrated with time uh, how much is your average power that uh, multiplied with your time will give you how much is the energy capacity that you are carrying so a good example uh, is you can again go through benchmark uh, uh, the other way you can go through benchmark uh, 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 data available online from formula student websites uh, 
uh, as for the discharge rate, that essentially is how much is the maximum peak current that you're drawing from your battery pack. So that will be dictated by the maximum torque that you are having from your battery uh, from, uh, on uh, at the output of your vehicle at any point of time so uh, how torque and speed works is torque is directly proportional to the current that you are uh, uh, pushing into your motor controller so uh, whenever you have a very high current that implies you are trying to have a huge uh, you have a huge torque requirement at the wheels so that typically happens when you are accelerating in a straight patch or when you are starting from very low speed so when you're push, uh, just ramming the throttle, that is when you'll have the maximum current uh, drawn out of your battery pack. Uh, okay, we have about uh, uh, five to six more minutes, uh, I think so. So we can take questions. We'll continue, I think. So next up, um, what can we do to make FDM stacks rule compliant? Uh, which rule? So FDM stacks generally are a problem because these are not these, uh, they have a lot of layering which can delaminate or delink. So unless you have done the testing that FDM can will not delaminate or the layers where the layering issue will not occur, you cannot be sure of uh, uh, whether FDM stacks will be able to withstand all the forces that your vehicle will go through while it's uh, while it's running on track. So I'd recommend FDM not to be used as a method for you uh, designing stacks. You uh, mm. Yeah, so what you can do is you can find vendors uh, who based on your FDM design can provide you vacuum casting of the same uh, uh, model that you have with, uh, with FDM. Okay, mm, next up, what consideration should be taken while using fused bus bars? Fused bus bar, again, so uh, if I'm understanding your questions right, your bus bar which also acts as a fuse or is it welding? Okay, so I'll uh, explain it to my understanding. So a fused bus bar is essentially uh, uh, your fuse should, uh, uh, it's a fusible link between your terminals. So the current, the nominal current or the maximum current has to pass through that fusible connection without the fuse seeing any damage or deterioration, uh, even if it, uh, it passes for an elongated period of time. But whenever an abnormal amount of current passes, then the fuse will break uh, break off and uh, will com completely disconnect. But again, so whenever you're using a fuse, your fuse have to be very precisely rated. Your design calculations for your fuse are very critical because your I square T rating, what is the short circuit current that you will be observing? These calculations need to be made. So you cannot have that, those level of calculations in a very short duration of time. If you are doing a research on it, then this might help. But uh, for designing a Formula Student uh, race car, a fused bus bar, which you're designing on your own, unless you can prove that you have done all the calculations, these uh, I will not recommend. So it's again, a make versus buy uh, uh, trade off you'll have to do because making and testing it will be much costlier than buying it right away. Next up, most of the people use 18650 for the cylindrical battery. Can you tell about this? So 18650 are, uh, as I was explaining about cylindrical cells, those are very standard. Uh, they come in very standard shapes and sizes, which is 18650 and uh, 21700. Uh, because of which their shape is uh, very fixed. The tolerances in their shape are also very well controlled. And these also come with a standard energy capacity. So you can connect many of them in series parallel. They come with, because they are widely used in the industry, many people have designed cell holders for them. So you can uh, directly buy cell holders so that you can assemble cell, cells, uh, cell modules together. But you should definitely have extra provision to have the cell uh, stacks uh, fixed with your battery enclosure. You should, even if you have cell holders, if you buy cell holders for using 18650 cells, uh, you should not just keep them uh, and they they should not be shaking inside your battery uh, accumulator randomly. Uh, 
so yeah so another uh, key factor about 18650 cells is their uh, dimensions are fixed 18 mm diameter 650 mm 65 mm of uh, height uh, height so the assembly becomes simpler uh, the interconnections are also you have to have some kind of welding done like i've shown uh, so from the images that i have uh, attached in the presentation uh, which i'll be sharing with you anyways so you can refer to those images for your reference on what 18650 cells look like what do their cell holders look like how do you make interconnection with these cells how do you stack them so cylindrical cells whenever you google it or search it online you will find huge amounts of battery designs about uh, around 18650 cells but yeah this is just one component cell is just one component in your battery design you have a lot of other hardware around it the cell holders the interconnection the output terminals the maintenance plugs the contactors the electronics the bms wires coming from the cell taps to your battery uh, from cell taps to your bms boards so it's a lot more uh, uh, there are a lot of other stuff around 18650 that you need to design uh, as well so you can use the images for reference but if you have any more doubts you can contact me uh, separately mm, i think so we have time for just uh, one or two more questions uh, an accumulator uh, so ts accumulator have 80 kilowatt power limit as per rule book so do we calculate max power using max voltage times max current so that is again i explained earlier it is the maximum volt uh, that is the instantaneous voltage times the instantaneous current that you are drawing at any point of time even at lower voltages when you have higher current drawn that can also exceed the voltage limit and the power limit or if you have maximum voltage and even lesser amount of current that can also breach the 80 kilowatt power limit so it's the instantaneous voltage times the instantaneous current it's not nominal or maximum okay next uh, why do we use pouch cells in battery design because they have much more energy uh, they are much more energy dense uh, as, uh, as opposed to cylindrical or uh, prismatic cells mm, these are not rigid they have a variety of capacity options available with them their shape you can have tabs on one side or tabs on either sides uh these are the advantages disadvantages being these are very uh, uh you need to provide a external enclosure to it uh, external support to it but your overall battery weight and battery volume is drastically reduced if you use pouch cells that is the main reason why people use uh, pouch cells uh i think so we can go with a few more questions uh should the hardware for balancing the battery cells be incorporated in the bms pcb or should we have a dedicated board for balancing the cells time to time so uh, for balancing your cells first of all you need to know what voltages of you know, of each and every cells are there so from the voltages you can figure out what soc uh, the cells are at for which you need the bms in place so your bms will definitely need it for doing a balancing so you can either choose to have your balancing resistors or balancing circuitry on the same board or on a different board that's not a concern at all but if you have more number of boards the communication between board becomes a bottleneck and uh, if at all there is a loose contact or miscommunication happening between your balancing board and your bms board that becomes another thing that you need to debug if at all something goes wrong so you can do it either way but uh, it helps if it's on the same board one thing to consider here is your balancing current is also limited by how what resistors you are using for balancing the cells so your balancing resistors will be essentially discharging the cell so these resistors are essentially heating up so this heat should not uh, affect the bms voltage measurement accuracy at all so you should take that into consideration while you are designing balancing and the bms pcb that the heat should not get transferred from one uh, from the balancing to the uh, measurement circuitry mm, okay so next up what should be the typical and safe numbers of parallel cells for operation there is no typical there is no safe number for this particular question your uh, you can connect as many cells in parallel or series only thing is your bus bars your interconnection between these parallel modules to the next parallel module that becomes a problem if you have huge number of parallel cells 
so you uh, it's up to you how much you need to connect in parallel it's up to your battery configuration it's uh, what, how your battery is designed around that uh, you can connect number of uh, that is the number in series and parallel and uh, safe number lower the better because lower the points of failure are there there is no safety in uh, terms of using the cells but it's safety in terms of how you are designing it and how you are assembling it uh now we go to the last question uh other questions i'll be answering uh, on mail you can uh, these questions we have already noted down so i'll be answering them separately uh forgive me for that but uh, the last question is uh, do we need fusing in the voltage sense wire in bms so this helps to keep your bms board safe but uh, this will also affect your uh, measurement accuracy because fuses have very low resistance but the current drawn by your uh, 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 by your bms for cell voltage measurement is also very less but definitely a fusing if you are rating it correctly this will definitely help but it's not compulsory to have uh, fusing on the cell voltage line it definitely helps in safety uh, in case something goes wrong but it's not necessary uh, okay that's it for uh, my side this was the last question other questions i'll be taking it up uh, as we move along uh, hopefully you like the session hopefully i was informative and helpful if you have any more questions if you want to contact me for any uh, help regarding calculations but obviously i would not like to spoon food you because uh, i'd want you to learn as well and learn as you go along but uh, if you have any questions you can reach out to kathy or you can reach out to me anytime okay thank you guys kathy you can take it up All right, everyone. I think uh, Mukul is. Uh, will you be ready to share your presentation right now? So Mukul's part will be on uh, battery safety. Uh, Mukul, you can share your screen. Yeah, just sharing. Yeah. Uh, is it visible now? Yes, it is. Great. Okay, great. You can go ahead. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, so. now we'll be taking up the second second part of today's session which which is focused on accumulator safety so while shardul also uh, touched touched upon some of the points regarding safety but this will be like a much uh, deeper dive and much more specific to only the safety part of it there might be a little bit of overlap uh, but i will i will actually want this to be exhaustive so that you guys can create your own checklists like like how we mentioned in the description so accumulator safety uh, as i have written there right it's it's majorly three things right if you are aware of what you are doing you apply your common sense in design assembly and if your state of mind is good uh, i mean you are not fatigued then it's not a big challenge actually it's it's pretty much very simple then okay so let's move on then so that's me on the right uh, that's uh, last year's formula bharat event so i'm mukul jangit i work at ather right now and my job my ro my job is to basically support a uh, production team in engineering related issues for battery and i'm also the safety engineer uh, for battery here at ather and i've been involved with formula bharat formula student for 5 years now 3 years at college and then 2 years after that with formula bharat and i was actually a colleague of shardul in the college also so okay then that was the intro so so the first so i'll just uh, take you through the agenda what we will be covering today so why accumulator safety basis of the cell saf safety or uh, how do we design for a safe accumulator what points should we take care so that we don't uh, make a mistake in manufacturing and assembly we'll look at some uh, not so good design and manufacturing examples what we have seen in the competition last year or even some of the mistakes we have done then we'll go through some testing safety related points and then we'll just uh, brush up on some incident control points if something indeed goes wrong so that's the agenda and then we'll have a short q and a session after that so first we start with why accumulator safety so there are obviously direct hazards uh, working on the accumulator the, so the teams which decide to go with higher voltages like more than 100 volts like 400 volt systems there is a direct electrocution risk right if you guys are uh, don't uh, remove maintenance plus for example or if the hvd is not removed and directly touch it there's a major electrocution risk and which can be fatal anything above 70 volts can can actually be uh, dangerous to you so there's a direct electrocution risk as far as the battery is concerned there is a risk of toxic chemicals uh, exposure uh, so if if let's suppose the cell leaks if the cell vents out gases the gases are very uh, 
no corrosive and uh, and very toxic in nature so that there's that hazard there's of course a fire and explosion hazard uh, as you saw the photos earlier and we'll again see some more photos here so cells do release explosive gases so that's there of course there are some indirect effects uh, any safety incident is usually a high a huge confidence deterrent on the team right because uh, there is a rhythm you guys are just going through a competition and then something bad happens it's it's a huge confidence deterrent so so you really want to avoid it these uh, safety incidents can sometimes be very costly and more importantly because uh, you know batteries are very high lead uh, time items uh, you usually import them from outside then even the manufacturing of battery itself takes quite a long time so that's the second indirect effect and it can also result into a high degree of collateral damage uh, what i mean by collateral damage is damage to your vehicle damage to your lab or uh, damage to facilities around damage to any equipment things like that so uh, you you guys would keep on uh, seeing these things in the media right so uh, the same the same thing which actually shardul was also uh, talking about fire puts fsg team members in hospital so this happened in 2016 uh, where people had actually bypass some safety uh, safety equipments on their batteries and then the incident happened uh, there's this uh, photo on the right which you see this is again an overcharge event as far as we know and this you can clearly see the level of collateral damage here and then this is a short video on what overcharge can uh, lead to we'll quickly go through this video oh, shit i just hold on So this is a pouch cell. So you you could see the venting of gases followed by um, massive explosion actually. So. uh this is this is not uh this is not a very common uh common incident basically if your bms is working fine if you respect your cell limits which we'll see later on uh these are sort of very rare uh things uh, i mean you your confidence should not be down because of these uh incidents uh if you take all the precautions if your design is robust enough then uh, they are they are not that difficult to avoid uh one more small video we'll just have a look at uh, this is also regarding the collateral damage so here uh, we have we have like some 3 4 vehicles in a charging bay so what i wanted to show you in that video was how the fire uh, spread from one vehicle to another vehicle and then to another vehicle that is basic the collateral damage uh, what i was talking about and one one more thing that you guys want to uh, take from that particular video is basically that torch like flame uh, it's it's not a mildly burning flame right it's it's a torch so it's it has that much energy so it makes it even more dangerous so now we'll start uh, going through the actual actual content so first is basics of cell safety so we'll quickly go through the cell anatomy so basically a lithium ion cell uh, which most of the teams uh, use has basically has uh, three things uh, an anode a cathode and a separator in between uh, and of course the electrolyte so the separator is like a very 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 thin uh, plastic uh, layer which does not allow a uh, cathode and anode to short between themselves and because it is so thin it is also a weak point so for example you would have seen a nail penetration video uh, in which an, a nail going through would actually puncture through the uh, through the separator and that would that would eventually short your positive and negative electrode and then that leads to a discharge that leads to a increase in temperature and then that increases the chemical reactions even further and then that's basically thermal runaway which will come to later on also uh, so then uh, we then basically coming to the cell selection so there is a form factor which even shardul touched upon so there is a there is a pouch cell which is available cylindrical cell which is available and prismatic cells which are available so majorly uh, 
the difference between these cells uh, so basically if you look at cylindrical cells right cylindrical cells comes with steel casing uh, so steel casing first of all provides a good mechanical integrity uh, they are much more uh, so even if you drop them it's of course it's not good but then they are not as bad as pow cell or a prismatic cell for that matter cylindrical cells also interestingly come with their own safety elements for example in in this particular photo uh, what you can see is ptc or uh, this thing is called as a cid and then if you can see these two little v's here uh, this is ba basically the venting uh, the venting bus disc so they come with uh, three more 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 of most of the cylindrical cells basically come with three safety elements which are ptc uh, venting and cid so what cid means is uh, current interrupt device so basically if inside of your cell uh, something goes wrong then the temperature increase that leads to a little bit of pressure build up and then this is a mechanical switch so it basically just pops up and cuts off the current so if you if you cut off the current then you prevent uh, subsequent damage to the cell ptc also does the same thing uh ptc is a positive thermal coefficient uh, thing it's basically a polymer which has a very low resistance under in 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 normal temperatures but if the temperature goes up then the resistance increases quite considerably and it basically again limits the uh the amount of damage good thing with ptc is that it's a resettable uh, thing like in in cid once the damage is done then you then you, you have to throw the cell you cannot really reset a cid same thing with the venting and what venting does is if if let's suppose cid is not able to do anything ptc is not able to do anything and the pressure keeps on building now this is basically the weak point which actually somebody asked in the last uh, ppt as well so this is the weak point so this blows up and then you have your gases venting from here so that it it does not explode the cell does not explode so that is about the cylindrical cell so much more uh, so inherently safer is is the cylindrical cell pow cells uh, unfortunately don't come with any of this uh, you have to have your own hard casing built around it and you have to make sure that the temperatures are uh, are nicely monitored and uh, all of those things prismatic cells are a bit better some of the prismatic cells uh, have hard casing and they also have a venting device then chemistry some of the cells are inherently safer like you you would have heard lithium uh, uh, lithium iron phosphate cells are much safer than the nmc chemistries or other high energy density uh, chemistries out there but then of course it comes with a penalty as far as energy density is concerned and the power that you can draw from it third is the third is basically finding a reliable supplier so this is very important because uh, even if even if you take all the precautions right you maintain those temperatures you maintain those voltage limits you respect the current limits then also sometimes if there's a there's a micro defect inside the cell which can potentially lead to a puncture between you know, which can potentially lead to a puncture of your separator then that's not also a good thing so good suppliers basically maintain a very uh, high degree of clean rooms when they are manufacturing sometimes they also uh, check they also do an extra check for all of the cells actually some of the suppliers so although the price goes up a little bit but then you can be sure that uh, your cells will not be inherently safe so do do a background check of what supplier of of whatever supplier you are trying to buy the cells from that will actually also help you in making a balanced pack because when the supplier gives you a set of cells uh, those cells will all come with a similar grade and their resistance cells would be more or less in the same ballpark so their ages would be more or less in the same uh, same ballpark so then your all the cells in your pack uh, basically goes up and down at the same time and you sort of take the maximum amount of juice which is possible next is cell handling storage and transport so that is where uh, once the cells have arrived at your location what do you do to make sure they are safe right so uh, just give me a second guys yeah so as far as cell handling is concerned one of the one of the major thing that you guys always need to uh, ensure is that you don't short the cell so unlike a unlike a lead acid battery or like the other uh, nickel metal hydride batteries or whatever other batteries are present over there they have they have a fairly high resistance in them so even if you short it it's not really that big of a deal but uh, lithium ion cells uh, their internal resistance is very low so if you short it from outside high amount high amount of currents flow and that leads to increase in temperature and then that can lead to all the nasty things that you have seen so you need to definitely uh, avoid shorting during handling of the cells as far as storage is concerned so if if you are storing the cells for a longer duration like 4 months 5 months 6 months 
then uh, ideally you would want to uh, keep them at a temperature below 25 degrees celsius that helps you to get the maximum of maximum as far as the calendar aging is concerned because even if you leave the cells out there they do age they also store them at a low soc so that uh, you know the electrical energy is not is is not a lot when if, if indeed something goes wrong you also store them away from combustibles uh, you prevent all sorts of impact like you have a good casing in which you store those cells and sometimes if you are for example using cylindrical cells which have a steel casing then you might actually want to control the humidity as well so you know some you would want to control humidity below 40 or below 50 so that the cells don't rust and because if they if they do rust then the gasket that you see around here uh, might actually fail and you might have a short hair between positive and negative one of the other ways to maintain that is basically using a silica gel you can just put a lot of silica gel bags there and that can also control your humidity so now uh, you need to respect the cell limits uh, so basically mechanical damage as we discussed uh, you need to avoid the shorting you need to avoid drops of cells you need to avoid punctures you need to avoid bends basically you need to treat them like a baby in 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 one single sentence we need to respect the operating temperatures so a uh, data sheet would mention the temperatures respect those uh, and even if even if the data sheet temps are higher 60 degrees the upper limit i think in in our rule book so you need to respect that as well overcharge over discharge uh, so again you will have upper limit of voltage where you can take the cells to you will have the lower limit where you can take it to overcharge is uh, usually bit more severe than over discharge so you should definitely try to avoid it charging at low temperature is also very dangerous uh, because uh, that that actually at at lower temperature resistances are very high and when you charge it leads to again temperature build up and that can lead to bad things so avoid charging at low temperature and by low temperature i mean like something less than 10 degrees something less than 5 degrees uh, but if the temperature is like 15 to 20 degrees celsius then it's then it's more or less okay so basically a general rule of thumb is if you feel comfortable then the cells will also feel comfortable the temperature ranges are more or less the same for human beings and cells it's pretty funny thermal runaway so uh, you guys need to know what thermal runaway is uh, when you are working on cells thermal runaway is a phenomena in, in which what happens is if if let's suppose some some external shock happens or some internal shock happens uh, that leads to an elevation of temperature because of current flowing through a resistance i square r uh, joule heating so once that heating takes place that actually ac accelerates some chemical reactions and that increases the temperature even further and it's a positive feeding loop now so temperatures keep on going up and and then uh, basically if if it goes above 120 if it goes above like 130 140 degrees celsius uh, that is where the cells would start venting they might uh, you know catch fire as well and if if there is any ignition source then it can also explode the gases also if you have a lot of cells in the pack then one cell which has gone into a thermal runaway would then uh, heat up the other cells also so it will propagate the whole failure so you need to that's why you need to avoid you need to respect all the cell limits so you don't end up into a thermal runaway situation one more thing about thermal runaway is that uh, you know if you if somehow the cells are actually at a temperature like 70 degrees celsius or 80 degrees celsius and if they are in a adiabatic situation which means they are not able to exchange their heat with the environment then also internally they will slowly build up the temperature and can go into a thermal runaway so that's about thermal runaway now we move on to design for accumulator safety so of course the first uh, and and the most important thing is following the rule book rule book is indeed the bible uh, it with a with a lot of experience that formula student has uh, generated has generated over last 10 7 8 or 10 years uh, the rule book is is actually quite exhaustive so do follow every single rule uh, make sure you know what the intents of the rule are if you if you're not sure then then contact us we are there to help you guys and this is the point which even shardul mentioned in his last ppt so when when you make an assembly which is really easy as far as accessibility is concerned and your assembly is very clean it is indeed the safest assembly you can make because uh, the fatigue is less uh, you can use all of your insulated tools you can use those gloves and it's much more safer you can see everything so always aim for a clean assembly always aim for uh, ease of access not just for accumulator this i would recommend for the entire vehicle but especially for the accumulator 
cell load paths and tab loading so this is a very important uh, point so so last time actually we had a we had a couple of teams uh, who had not necessarily done a good job at this so what this means is when a vehicle is moving of course your cells have a lot of weight they they amount to usually more than 70 80% of the accumulator weight so all of those inertial loads are actually in your cell bodies so you need to make sure that those uh, loads are not causing a deformation on the cells but rather that load is actually transmitted into the casing so you need to do those uh, those fem analysis you need to do some testing and you you also need to make sure that you take deflection into account and not not just stresses so that is uh, so you you have to essentially avoid very high deformations on the cells you should definitely avoid tab loading tab loading when it comes to uh, pouch cells because it, if you load a tab then there is a chance that it can displace the uh, you know the the layers inside or it can open up the pouch from top or uh, it can cut it away so you should definitely avoid tab loading as well you should always aim for a full cad a detailed full cad in which you have all the harnesses uh, you should consider their bending radiuses the stub length of all the connectors you should provide cable strain relief all of those good things so your full cad will actually help you a lot in uh, getting your accessible and ease of and a clean assembly you should definitely avoid all the sharp metals or any loosely constrained metal in accumulator or for that matter any loosely constrained part positive locking is a must uh, even if even if it's not a cell you should definitely have positive locking because even if some nut uh, loses around and goes and short somewhere it's a disaster so make sure you have positive locking all around and as shardul also mentioned the last ppt uh, you should you should not use nylock nuts you should not use uh, thread locker compounds uh, you should use all the all the things which are actually allowed in the rule book no plastic stacking uh plastic stacking is a phenomena in which uh, you depend on the plastic to be in compressive uh, load to in turn provide a clamp load which then reduces your contact pressure so what generally happens is your plastic gives away with time in a couple of days or in 10 days or depending on the material it will give away and when it gives away there's no tension in that bolt if there's no tension in that bolt there's no pressure on the contact if there's no pressure on the contact your contact resistance is very high your high contact resistance at those high currents would mean a lot of heat that means a lot of temperature and then you can imagine the rest so uh, definitely avoid plastic stacking pay extra attention to accumulator assembly in car so usually uh, what i've seen is that this turns out to be an aftermath for a lot of teams but you should think of it right from the start of the design how you would actually assemble the accumulator in the car in fact in our times we used to take a target that will we'll be able to put a accumulator within 20 minutes in the car and that is very important because sometimes you might uh, you know strain the wires uh, you might click clim uh, you might uh, clinch some wires uh, you might drop your accumulator in the worst scenario or you might forget putting some uh, important fasteners so definitely have a good sop and a, a good way of assembling or accumulating the car then uh, you should have a charger which is suggested by the manufacturer uh, charging profiles it should be a safe charger with all the all the indications all the good voltage accuracies current monitoring all of those good things component selection uh, across the board you should do it taking into account the voltage ratings your current ratings when you are selecting your relays on the pcb or your fuses or all sorts of wiring right but bms should be super reliable bms is is the is the most important thing uh, which which will actually help you avoid all sorts of safety incidents right so what i want to uh, tell you guys here is basically a priority when when it comes to designing your bms so bms as shardul mentioned earlier has a lot of design objectives so uh, what i would what i would suggest you guys is that especially for the new teams that you start first with making sure that your temperature and voltage me measurement measurements are accurate within uh, whatever uh, you guys want to achieve uh, if that is accurate then you can basically move on to implementing a cutoff system if that is done then after that you can move on to balancing or even before that you should actually uh, oh wait let let me start off again so first is uh, voltage and temperature measurement second uh, comes cutoffs associated with that third comes a proper data logging 
and then fourth is your balancing because uh, i mean you should not go all out and start to do everything at once uh, because these things take time and these things take a lot of testing so make sure you do that also it's it's fair if you make a good make versus buy decision make versus buy decision at the start of your project as far as bms is concerned uh insulation is very important in battery your all of your hv contacts wherever you can touch should be covered uh you should you should not have any unintended leakage paths or current paths for example uh, currents going through screws for example which are actually high resistance uh your uh, your all the metallic components in the accumulator which are close to tractive uh, tractive wires or tractive uh, points should be grounded so that your imd can detect all of those uh, faults and uh, you should actually carry out some sort of an analysis of where all you can have chances of short so look at your design see how many short points are there see how can how you can avoid it like maybe you can put some more covering and uh, basically reduce the chances of short waterproofing should not be an afterthought uh, it should be a very integral part of your design uh, we have, we have we have seen again and again people putting duct tape so please please think about it again because if when you have hv systems water can really create problems your tsal uh, hv hv interlocks hv indicators these are all safety systems for your accumulator and hv protection so uh, these systems really need to be reliable and you need to uh, give that time and that testing for these systems you might actually think of putting a self contained fire extinguishing system also uh, some teams are trying to do that uh, then of course you should have design reviews uh, multi layer design review so that you don't miss out on these points uh, this is just one photo so a team has nicely put these covers uh, this will ensure this is basically a waterproofing which is not an afterthought so this is i think tu dresden uh, i'll show them but a really uh, well thought out thought, thought of waterproofing method i think then we come to manufacturing and assembly safety in our life cycle of formulation project so you should never be working alone on cells and accumulators right uh, you should always have at least two people who are both aware of what what the hazards are what the risks are how the design works right uh, you should have a clean work area uh, with defined layout evacuation paths should be there uh, your tools should be always in the same place it should not be a messy uh, looking place because just like a clean design helps you in safety a clean uh, work space also helps you in safety you should have adequate ppes uh, ppes is now because of covid everybody knows personal protective equipment so you should have your hv gloves your goggles must when you are working on uh, on accumulators your multimeters should be rated for high voltage jewelry should be strictly not allowed no eating drinking in hv area very basic discipline stuff your tools should be hv rated and you should always use hv rated tools and again we discussed last time that your uh, accessibility should be there so you can indeed use these tools because these tools tend to be a bit bigger than the other tools so make sure that the accessibility is there in fact a good idea is to actually put these tools in the cad itself and see whether it will fit or not later on you should have uh, your working tables should have rolling wheels so that in in uh, in a bad event you can actually roll it out roll it out and uh, avoid avoid some uh, collateral damage if possible of course if it's if it's already caught fire then you should not risk yourself you should take that judgment it should have a non flammable and rigid construction so it can support all the weight of your uh, tools your battery your charger all those things you should have sops and your people should really be trained so what i mean by sops is standard operating procedure uh, how do you how do you basically assemble a stack you should have you know virtually thought of how you would actually do the assembly you know, point, listing down all the steps because sometimes even the sequence matters sometimes the right tool matters so you should have it written down and get it reviewed by your team seniors you should be fresh when you are starting a battery assembly uh, fatigue is one of the major reasons of why uh, you know incidents happen because you are not in the right state of mind your when you are working uh, you should make sure that uh, it's ergonomic uh, posture so your tables and everything should be designed according to that uh, this is one important point uh, when, as soon as you get the cells uh, what i would recommend to you guys is that you serialize all the cells so when you serialize the cells then what you do is you basically maintain a simple excel log right so day 1 what were the cell voltages and uh, then as you use those cells just keep on uh, populating that table so 
how it helps you is to identify cells which are you know which are having either a very high resistance or which are which are either having a very high uh, self discharge or when assembled in a battery some cells which are uh, discharging by themselves indicating a unintentional uh, leakage path so that you can root cause that what is wrong with your battery assembly so cell serialization would be really helpful in that way uh then when when it comes to actually assembling the cells into the module uh, this is this is one of the most crucial points so so you should uh, always just, just give me a second guys yeah so you should you should do a visual defect check of all the cells that you are putting in your module uh, by visual check what we mean is you know any any cuts on the on the pouch or any dents or any bend kind of a thing or any any electrolyte leakage or things like that before you actually put it into the module uh you should make sure that when you have those cells on the table they are all insulated and you take like one one cell by one cell so that you you don't have a lot of live cells out there put the insulations on those cells uh don't manhandle and push the cells into your stacks uh take care of the tolerances right from the design so that your assembly is smooth uh focus on the container manufacturing your accumulator container is actually the base of all of your assembly right if your accumulator container itself has a lot of uh, tolerance issues then you would struggle a lot throughout the season so you should really uh, put uh, put that time make sure your walls are nicely aligned make sure your holes are all aligned so that later on you are not forcing bolts through it and you know creating a safety hazard later on controlling modification work on accumulator so i think this is really important this is where the esos come in so what what i am intending to say here is that so formula student is a project right and it you won't get it first time right so when you first time you assemble your battery or when you assemble it in your vehicle you would definitely find some issues and you might want to use your cutting tools your drill machines your dremel all of those things but be very 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 careful this this is this is a point uh, uh, which will which will definitely lead to a lot of uh, safety hazards so your eso should basically make sure that everything is safe uh, you know you might want to uh, turn not take out the maintenance plugs take out the hvds you know take out those uh, tsmt keys all of those things and ensure that you are your cutting tools never can can never uh, go through any high voltage path in fact i would i would uh, definitely recommend that you always take out all the stacks and then at a container level you do all of these things rather than doing at the back level but be but be very careful we have seen people using lighter on the live accumulator to to shrink a heat shrink and which is definitely not a good idea people using makeshift insulation taping and uh, sometimes people would use insulation taping but they won't be aware of the voltage rating so make sure you have the correct insulation tapes uh, use of plastic panels they might be very flimsy so don't don't just uh, you know do makeshift jugards uh so soldering and heat shrink installation on assembled battery it's very risky uh, because the soldering tip itself is a metallic tip so make make sure you have all the protections and make sure the eso is aware so this is a special point i've added so generally when we are assembling when we are making a accumulator generally we use epoxies and carbon fibers so these again come with their own safety nuances epoxies are not safe to be inhaled and carbon fibers also generate a lot of those uh, small dust which you should not inhale so you should be very careful when using epoxy and carbon fibers uh, go through the msds and take the appropriate safety precautions uh, you know use safety goggles use inhalers all those things so now we'll go through some 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 examples that we have seen in in the competition so i'll just take all of them so you can see the photos on the right so uh, these nickel strips have a hole uh, but the hole is not done in a centralized way and it has actually made a hole so this will not be a really good contact and it it can actually slip out of the bus bar and can short and potentially make a safety hazard and also the contact resistance thing here it can heat up all of those things similarly here if you see uh, the cut, uh, i don't know what the actual design is but again it can tear up from here because copper is not as it's it's barely imm so do make sure your e, e by eds and all of those good things are taken care Uh, so plastic stacking uh, leading to welding uh, because of contractions we discussed uh, sometimes people use bare metallic sheets for cell holding that can create uh, you know impressions on the cells and can deform them so again don't manhandle the cells 
uh, ignoring the tolerance stack up we should not be using fast as the primary current conductor ever uh, 3d printed parts without considering the layer effect i think there was a question also last time so uh, you should make sure that you consider the layering effect the infill ratio all of those things last at, at, in the last event we had a couple of teams whose 3d printed parts were actually failing in the accumulator so make sure you test them out first in fact uh, as we recommended vacuum casting is one of the method which is which is much better as far as i as far as uh, you know the directionality of forces are concerned they, they can take the loads in almost all the direction so your fem results will match a lot to your final product testing safety so you should so basically component level testing system level testing and procedure level testing is something which you should always be looking for uh, i'll give you some examples uh, so what i mean by component uh, level testing is for example uh, some teams were doing the waterproof waterproof of the rain test for the first time when they came to competition last time so you might want to do a box level waterproofing first without even assembling the cells and that is so safe and you can right away make modifications so that is like one component level testing of course all the component level testing if you are using alternate materials uh, your as far as procedure level testing is concerned something like a crimping process which you use for hv lugs uh that procedure should be checked whether you are getting the adequate uh, pull force or not a uh, system level testing one of the example is testing your precharge discharge circuitry at a system level in an offline manner and not necessarily on the battery on the first go uh and then when it actually comes to running your car and using your uh, accumulator you should always run a rules compliant safe car this goes without saying and you should ensure your driver safety with all the recommended gear uh, they should not be expired uh, all the harnesses the the nomex gear uh, the the nomex shoes the driver suit all of those things whenever you are charging or you are balancing your pack it should be done in supervision because as we have seen earlier majority of the incidents happen during charging and balancing activities a uh, cell is super sensitive when you are charging it as far as safety incidents are concerned so make sure uh, you attend the cells at the battery pack when you are charging or balancing it you should make testing protocols so when you are running your car there should be defined roles of which person will take what calls and uh, you know procedure should be there you should have a pre inspection you should have a post inspection pre inspection of battery for example uh, maybe you would want to check all the cell voltages maybe you would want to check that all of your thermistors are good post inspection again you would want to check your cell voltages uh you know just having a double check whether anything is anything has gone bad or not because sometimes uh, sometimes what happens is you might have a very good bms you might have all of your cells nicely balanced but then if if one of your thermistors uh, crimps are loose if or if your solders are loose or if your voltage sensing is loose then it actually gives a wrong value to bms which can also lead to uh, a, a wrong cut off so those kind of inspections you should do you might consider using loto loto is basically lockout tagout system so when you guys are working on the track on the on the battery and or or on any other system of the car and you don't want that somebody you know accidentally turns on the battery and there is high voltage in the car so you can you can basically put a lock in lock in there so that nobody uh, mistakenly does it so loto is a very common practice in industry should carry fire extinguishers uh, when you are when you are testing your vehicles uh safety critical indicators or equipments like tsal your hvd your hv indicators your emergency switches all of your team members should have awareness they should know what the green light on tsal means they should know what the red light means they should know how to take out the hvd when to take the hvd hv indicator people should be aware of and of course the emergency switches and this is not just esos or electrical people this is everybody in your team cell disposal and incident control so what are bad cells so bad cells are basically as we discussed cells which have either been overcharged cells wherein you can see visible dents cells which are flexed you know cells which have vented out which have leaked electrolyte all of those are bad cells so you would want to quarantine them you would want to dispose them so if if you if it looks safe i mean if there is no uh, leakage as such you would want to discharge the cells so that there is as well as electrical energy as possible if that is not possible you might consider them putting into a salt water solution so that it discharges safely in water and the temperatures don't go high before actually scraping it out for fire suppression of uh, you should keep co2 based fire extinguishers uh, 
you can use water for small modules because what water does is basically it, it keeps the temperature down and temperature as we discussed in the thermal runaway also is something which leads to fire so you can reduce the you can reduce the temperature using water reignition so as you see in this video so even if you have doused the fire the fire can actually come up again so here the tesla is burning and look at the torch kind of a flame and they were able to tow it out and then again on the tow truck it again started again caught fire so reignition is very common as far as packs are concerned so make sure you keep it in a quarantine location and you can use your infrared temperature sensors to check whether the temperatures are below a safe limit dealing with injuries so these are the different kind of injuries you can have you can have burns you can have respiratory issues if you inhale those vented gases there can be skin or eyes irritation electrical shock as we discussed and there can be ingestion of harm, harmful chemicals because we are using epoxy and all of those things in battery so for all of these kinds of injuries you should have somebody's contact of a doctor's contact of a facility's contact which you can go to and you should not be looking for the contact right away so always you should be ready with the contacts and you know just and for simple things like burns and wounds and those kind of things uh, you should actually have a first aid kit at your lab so that's it guys uh, that was the deck from my side uh, references i mentioned here then now i think we can take up the q and a's thanks a lot Hi Mukul, we have uh, compiled the questions uh, from Mangesh Mishra's question onwards. Uh, you can have a look and and see. And if it is possible, uh, if you're still within time, we could go back to the questions that came up in Shardul's session. Otherwise, uh, uh, participants can email in their questions in as well. You can go ahead. Okay, okay. just give me a second. Can you hear me, Kathy? Yes. If my data sheet. So the first question is, if my data sheet says that there's 45 degrees Celsius temperature for 2700 20, mAh cells or higher discharge, but the limit set in rule book and even in data sheet is 60, do I still need cooling? Okay, so uh, basically you need to take the lower temperature. So if your data sheet says that you should not take the cells above 45, then you should not take it above 45. It's it's the lower one. So if the data sheet says 62, then you should take 60. It's a lower between the rule book and the data sheet, if I got your question correct. How to detect actual mechanical state of relay? I, I, I'm not sure whether this is a safety question. I think Shardul will take it up. Uh, when designing a cooling system, how does one effectively thermally model the cells in software? This would be needed to simulate, predict whether the system will operate safely. So uh, what you guys can do is, uh, there are cell cyclers available. Okay, uh, I'm not sure whether you will have access to one or not. But using those cell cyclers, you can uh, do some. You can run some schedules, and you can figure out what the internal resistance of your uh, of your cell is. And once you have the internal resistance, uh, you can. Or also, sometimes the internal resistance would be mentioned in the data sheet, and then you can use a, an I square R approach to uh, sort of, you know, model how much heat it will produce and then put it back in your cooling model. That is one of the simple approaches. If you're, you if you actually don't need a cell cycler, you can also do some basic tests. Uh, if, I think it should be possible. There's enough material on the internet to figure this out. If you are using prismatic cell, how can we, in, how can we assure the positive locking of the battery minerals? As we need to use boards for making the connections. So I think what you are asking is that if you are using if you are using uh, prismatic cells and they have blind uh, blind threaded holes, then how do you make sure that it's positively locked? So actually, this this is a question which which comes up very often, even when you talk about contactors. So and the answer to that is a you can uh, you can so the first thing is you should use the supplier uh, recommended torques. I think that is mentioned in the rulebook also. So you should use a torque wrench and use a supplier in um, supplier uh, recommended torque, and you can you can also use a spring washer. I don't think using a using a safety wire would be possible in this case. Another thing, what you can use is you a tap washer. So a tap washer would also make sure that you that your bolts don't come out. So I think tap washer is a good method there. Which kinds 
which kind of algorithms must be considered while making a customized thermal measuring circuit of the back see as far as measurement is concerned uh, all you need is a thermistor i i'm not sure what you mean by algorithm i mean you plug in your uh, thermistors and then you read those temperatures uh, one thing is the thermistor uh, manufacturer usually gives you an equation and using that equation you can convert the resistance into the corresponding temperature if that is the question or oh, temperature based duration of current also oh, i think the question is temperature based direct how do you direct based on temperature so uh, this this can vary depending upon specific design uh, what you can for example do is let's suppose if your threshold uh, limit is 55 degrees temperature so as soon as your temperature uh, nears a, a, th a, a threshold which is before 50 like 50 degrees celsius then you put up a current limit and that i think you can test it out uh, like once you reduce the or even with your models like once you reduce the current level what is the rate of uh, temperature increase so then you you can do with two levels of threshold one is the lower threshold one is the higher threshold some people what they also do is as the temperature keeps on increasing from 50 to 55 for example they would have that in the denominator of the current so as the temperature increases the current limit reduces so that is one crude uh, way of doing it if anyone is anyone wondering what is a pms ic to be used i think shadur can answer this better uh, we are trying to balance the trade off between manufacturing and designing for cell stress to be made of abs plastic or aluminum we have any other sessions for the same hmm. so uh, if you if you guys are using aluminum it's, first of all it's a lot of metal and it it can lead to all of those uh, cell level shots i this this actually depends on the specific design it it cannot be just answered like that uh but abs uh, turns out to be good enough if if you you know have your all the cross section thicknesses nicely uh designed and if you run some uh, proper fem analysis abs turns out to be enough for the loads that we that we are looking for i mean we have used abs in our times and we didn't find any issues uh you can use vacuum casting as i discussed that would be much closer to uh, your simulations than a fdm 3d printed approach if you go for higher quality fdm printing then also it's actually pretty good so abs should be okay actually of course you need to make sure that uh, it is it is uh, fr25 uh, or ul9b40 compliant i think that is there in the rule so you need to make sure of that is two thread rule okay. is let me lost one question yeah i think uh, that's all the questions we have as far as safety is concerned so th there's this one new question just come reframing my question my data sheet states cell optimum temperature limit to be 60 but it also says that if my discharge is 2700 amh or higher the cell can go up to 45 degrees so how do i need cooling i actually don't understand your question but uh, so if if your data sheet says that it can go up to 60 then why are you concerned at 40 degrees celsius i mean if you come to curry the temperatures itself are more than 40 the ambient temperature so uh please email it to me later on maybe um hi so mukul there were a couple of questions that were repeated which is why we took them off the compile list uh, repeated okay. from shadow's list so if at this time uh, there is an uh, you are able to answer a few questions from uh the previous time we can take that or we can uh, push it into q and a i'll i'll uh, let you decide upon that so how much time do we have kathy uh we are close to uh, reaching 9 I, i would say if if you want we can take another 10 to 15 minutes and actually get through the questions that were already asked uh okay, and fine, any fine. new questions they can go directly into uh, email cool so this is one question about contact tracing i think this you already answered uh, so basically you need to ensure four five things uh first is maintain a good pressure second is uh, you can have your bus bars coated with uh, nickel uh, with nickel tin so that uh, they don't uh, grow corrosion on them uh, you need to clean your bus bars before you use them uh, you need to have a sufficient uh, con su sufficient area which you put over there so i think if you do that then contamination is not a big deal uh, of course you need to make sure your uh, plastic you don't have a plastic stacking because if you have plastic stacking then your contamination can increase later on uh, once the plastic creeps out do bus bars connections come under critical fasteners yes they do uh, bus bar, bar like it's basically a high voltage high cut attractive current path so 
you definitely need to make sure that uh, all of your positive locking functionalities are are actually uh, there in your design last time we saw some teams using plastic fasteners for uh, maintenance plugs plastic bolt and plastic nuts that is definitely not allowed for cylindrical cells what is preferred surface cooling or tap cooling cylindrical cells don't really have a tap which is exposed so surface cooling is good enough i, I tap, taps are not there on cylindrical cooling taps are actually inside the cells which you can't access anyway is it safe to connect multiple bms units of smaller capacity in series uh, i i i'm not sure what this answer is actually from my electric if we use aluminum for cell mounting do we have to include it in ses use aluminum for cell mounting do we have to include in ses so uh, i'm not sure actually what you're asking but if you use aluminum for the container and if you use the recommended uh, thicknesses then you can mention it in ses and it's fine if you're using it for cell mounting uh, you have to uh, you know show the analysis of all the 40g uh, 40 20g rules that is anyway being asked in the ses so that you have to do for aluminum or plastic or whatever you do how do you suggest we test our cells for quality so uh, basically what you can do is so again as i discussed there are cell cyclers available uh, what you can do is uh, there's a set charging profile that you can run and then there's a discharging profile that you can run uh, those then you can compare those profiles to come at your uh, charging efficiency uh, so your coulombic efficiency your uh, internal cell resistances your total uh, energy which is there in the cells the total discharge energy which is available and then you can also uh, do a 1c discharge to see how much energy you are able to get before hitting the lower limit of voltage you can do a 2c discharge whatever your design asks for i i, I would recommend that you that you go through a course which is there on coursera uh, it's it basically goes through some it goes through five cycles of bms design and that actually answers all of these questions really nicely is cell tab welding uh, this is cell tab welding with bus bar pcb is safe to use okay so uh so if you are talking about spot welding then sometimes you can actually have concerns because uh, the thicknesses matter uh, copper is definitely something which is not as simple to spot weld your quality will also uh, vary a lot so as far as safety is concerned what you would want to do is uh, run some 10 15 samples 20 samples gain the confidence on the process right uh, as we discussed earlier uh, see what your uh, pull out forces are whether the whether the weld joints are strong enough or not uh, one more thing is how how much cross section are you able to achieve because then your contraction might might also be higher so you might need to figure out how many weld nuggets do you need so you can do a doe to figure out all of those things doe is designed for experiments if the spec sheet if the spec sheet says the discharge current is continuous current 0.2 c 5 amps and maximum discharge current is 2 c 5 amps how to determine the value and what is c what is c5 means so basically when when the cell supplier says 1c discharge or 2c discharge what he means by is uh, so basically there is a nominal capacity right so when you are buying the cells uh, the data sheet would say for example 6500 mh cells uh, that means 6500 milliamps if you draw it would discharge in 1 hour so that is 1c rate if you zero a 2c rate would mean 6500 multiplied by 2 0.2c would mean 0.2 multiplied by the nominal capacity that is the c rate how to make a proper ventilation for battery pack as well as maintaining it waterproof for rain test oh so that's a nice question so what so you can do a couple of things uh, you can what you can do is uh, if your if your cooling system is fully uh, enclosed in the battery and it does not depend upon any of the external air flow like if you are using pcm or if you are using uh, a liquid cooling i am not sure if anybody is using that then uh, it's fairly easy you can what you can do is you can uh, you can have a you can have an area in your uh, accumulator container and there you can put a sheet uh, which is which is not as strong as your accumulator which has a weak point right so just like how we saw the vent so it, or you can actually search for something uh, which is called as bus disks so bus disks are standard uh, disks that you get from the market uh, they basically open at a set pressure so search for that uh, you might be able to find something there or you can also use a spring loaded pressure relief valve how to check parts of the vehicle which are within 100 mm of any ts components of resistance below 5 uh, ohms to lv ground 
I'm not sure, but I think what you do is you use a multimeter. I, I actually, this is, I, I'm not comfortable with this question. I'll go to next. Uh, is it okay to make slots on the inner walls for cooling pr purpose? So it is okay to make slots. I mean, uh, all the all the points related to slots and holes are actually covered in the rule book. Uh, there is a rule of, you know, the slots are. Uh, I think there's a hundred mm length and six mm diameter rule that you need to make sure, and of course you need to make sure that those holes are not, uh, you know, creating a issue as far as container mechanical integrity is concerned, the structural integrity is concerned. So you need to uh, do those analysis and ensure that they are not the structural weak points of your container. But people do make slots. Oh, this on the inner wall. Oh, you mean the segment inner walls? Okay. I, I think we'll have to look at the design specifically of what you want to achieve. Can we use cell balancing method for region? Cell balancing is, is an entirely different concept. I mean, region, region basically means charging your battery back with your braking, but cell balancing basically means uh, uh, discharging the higher cells to the nominal sort of uh, voltages. So I'm not sure what you're trying to ask here. This, these are two different things. Okay, I think we have a clarification. How can we differentiate between the cells having different SOC while charging or discharging during BMS balancing? So that is where your SOC algorithms come into picture. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, you might actually want to go through that Coursera course. It, 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 it would tell you a lot of uh, good uh, ideas as far as making your own SOC algorithm is concerned. So how do you take the open circuit voltage? How do you take the terminal voltage? How do you take the open circuit voltage versus SOC graph and then sort of make a model uh, with which you can take the temperature readings, you can take the voltage readings and then tell what the SOC is. So your BMS in real time would be able to tell your row wise SOC and then you can use that SOC for your balancing. How do we counter cell failure? So if, if the cell failure basically means a minor uh, leakage or a venting event, then as we discussed, you need to uh, discard the cell. It's not safe for use. Uh, if it has all, if it's already sort of burning, then if it's in the initial stages, you might want to use a CO2 fire extinguisher to calm it down. Or don't, don't handle the cells right away. It would be super hot. It can actually injure you. If the situation is out of your control, it's much, much better to call, call for professional help. What sort of temperature sensors are used and how are they usually mounted? So usually two sorts of temperature sensors are used. People either use thermocouples or people use uh, thermistors. Thermistors are much more common because thermocouples require you to maintain a reference temperature also. So I would say a lot of people use thermistors. Thermistors comes in uh, different kinds of uh, different kinds of mounting uh, methods. There are tape like thermistors which you can just stick onto the surface using captain tape maybe. There are thermistors which are like like small capacitors that you see. Those are like uh, bead-like thermistors that you can probably use uh, uh, adhesive to stick it onto the cell tab or wherever you want to. Then I think there are uh, there are there are SMD uh, mounted thermistors and uh, thermistors also. But you need to make sure that the the gap rule is the 10 mm gap is actually uh, ensured. And you need to make sure that the temperature that they read are in, is indeed the temperature which the cell is at. So there are like three, four different kinds of temperature sensors. Is a two thread rule for fasteners applicable for OEM product like red lock as maintenance plug? So red lock, as far as I'm aware, does not have a thread. It's, it's basically you just uh, insert it in. It's a positive locking. So positive locking by itself. It doesn't have any fasteners. If you are talking about mounting the plugs, then yes, you need to make sure that the two thread rule is, is followed. For battery pack design, do we need to consider region breaking? Do we need to consider region breaking? So it completely depends on your motor controller abilities, uh, your cell limits, whether they can take that much charge or not. Uh, also depends on the maturity of your ECU, whether you'll be able to handle it or not. Uh, but and but but it, if you do consider it, then you can downsize your battery pack because you are essentially saving a lot of energy. So you can consider it's totally your choice if if you have the capability and you have the time to prove it. 
PMS SOC calculation here to get the number of cells in Fadler. What should be a way to safeguard against it? How much is it negligible? So one of the main uh, methods of how you can safeguard is is basically having a very uh, robust connection methodology. So we have seen cases in which in three P uh, in three P connections, for example, one of the cells is not connected properly because there is a the plane is not uh, horizontal. So if your cell mount if your cell connections are robust enough, then it would sort of show us. It, then all of them would discharge and charge at the same rate so that is one of the most important things when it comes to parallel uh, cells that you connect them in a very robust fashion Okay, for thermal modeling, I square R approach is only for heat generated. My question is more on the lines of how to model the heat extraction from cells. So I think this is the previous question, and there is a follow up. Why by air or liquid cooling? So if you go through basics of uh, air or liquid cooling, uh, uh, how it works is uh, so you can either run a very detailed fluid, uh, a CFD coupled with a thermal simulation, or to start off initially, you can do simpler calculations on even an excel sheet where you assume a value of h h is your heat transfer coefficient you you uh, you know the temperature of your cells you know your inlet air you know you know what level of uh, what level of temperatures are allowed at the exit of the air and using that you can figure out the flow rates you also know the pressure drop uh, which will be there across when when the air is traveling throughout your battery pack so now that you know your flow rate now that you know the pressure drop that you will see, then you can do the fan selection. So that is one of the approaches. For figuring out the pressure drop, you can either do a testing on your own accumulator or you can do a CFD analysis. If you need more details, uh, feel free to email me on this. Is it good to have a separate LV battery or use a DC DC converter and have a source derived from the HU battery? Basic safety design. So you are asking it from a safety uh, point of view. Let me think about this. Mm. I, th uh, I think the answer would be much more complicated than what I can tell you right now, but at least off the top of my head and in my experience, I've seen a couple of DCTC converters fail failing at the event, but a normal LV battery, a 12 volt battery usually is super reliable. So in interest of safety, I would actually say that LV, bat LV battery would be uh, safer if you mount it properly and if the connections are nice and good. I think LV battery would be safer because I've seen failures of DC DC converter. But it's a much more complex question than that. I, I'm sorry, I can't add much to it right now. Uh, great. I think uh, we have solved all Mughal, I think uh, Shadul had this one question uh, that he had to he you wanted him to answer, which was with regards to uh, the best PMS IC to be used. Yeah, I, I don't think I can answer that question. That is very much into electrical design. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I guess uh, Jagdish, you can email us at formula bar at dash electric at googlegroups.com. Uh, and since we are uh, done for today, uh, I'd like to thank Shardul and Mukul for uh, your time. I know two hours on a Sunday is quite long. Uh, thank you so much for your time and effort in putting this together and for answering all the questions today as well. Uh, to, um, to the rest of our participants, thank you for joining us on your Sunday. We really appreciate it. Uh, if you like the content that we have provided over here, uh, please uh, subscribe to our channel and keep following on uh, Formula Bharat uh, slash uh, dot com slash academy. Uh, we will be having more sessions about technical team management and project management up in the next few months. Uh, and uh, these will be complimentary, of course. Uh, if there are any questions, again, uh, for uh, the electric team specifically on electric technical rules, please write to formula bar at dash electric at googlegroups.com. We've already mentioned this in the chat box as well. Uh, thank you everyone. Have a good night.